Hi, good morning, everyone. We'll get started here in just a moment. Um, thank you all who have joined so far. Um, just stay tuned for another minute or two. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for Insurance and Disaster Resilient Housing Stock. Uh, I'm Monica Schrader. I'm the Director of Advocacy at Build Change. And this is part of a series we've been um, starting last year. We started organizing a series of webinars on our Climate Resilient Housing Initiative to address some of the key issues addressing climate resilience, disasters, and housing. Um, last year, we organized a webinar on policy and global policy, how that comes to play. And now we're addressing insurance, which is equally as important and um, our first series of the year. And I'll just pass in a moment to my colleague, Aqualine Suliali, who will be moderating today's conversation. And I wanted to just thank everyone for attending, let you know that there are opportunities to be involved in climate resilient housing through the submission of case studies, or information to our newsletter. If you're interested in participating in our Climate Resilient Housing Initiative, please feel free to email us at advocacy at buildchange.org. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat for everyone um, in case you'd like to get involved. There will be a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, hold them until then and we'll try to address as many as we can. And with that, I'd love to introduce my colleague, Aqualine Suliali, who will be moderating today's discussion. Aqualine, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today on this very important topic of ensuring a climate-ready housing stock. Um, today, um, I'm with Build Change. I'm the Director of Housing Finance Global, um, and I've been with Build Change for a short time, but I've been enjoying the work that Build Change does quite a lot. Um, I'm focused more on how do we make housing finance inclusive for those in the lower um, income levels of, um, of the demographics that we work with. Um, and today I'm joined with Henki Eko Putra. He's a research and development principal at MyPark in Indonesia. And Henki has been with MyPark for 14 years and he has quite a lot of experience in research and development principal, being a caretaker group head of research and development, as well as flood risk analysts. Um, and then we're also joined today with Caroline Kuski who is the Associate Vice President of Environmental, for the Environmental Defense Fund. And Carolyn has been um, with this organization um, for a few months now. However, she was previously with the uh, University of Pennsylvania and she's quite, um, quite equipped to discuss this topic as she's done quite a lot of research um, in this particular area that we're discussing today. Um, I'm just going to allow both our guests to introduce themselves. We'll start with Henki Eko Putra, and I believe he'll do a, a mini presentation and then Carol, Caroline will follow. And then the, the platform will be very much interactive. So although I will be leading with some Q&A questions, um, we are hoping that it will be more conversational than just answers and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kosi. Okay, thank you, Akalin. Uh, let me share some screen for, for the, all the audience first. Okay, so can you see my screen, uh, Akalin? Okay. 
Well, good good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a uh, evening time in Jakarta, actually. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Henki Ekoputra. I am one of the researcher in MyPark Indonesia, an insurance company that focuses on the natural disaster in in, the, in Indonesia. So to put uh, the, our discussion into the context, let me share a few a short introduction to you about the catastrophe risk and insurance in Indonesia. First of all, Indonesia is one of the most prone country in the world regarding to the catastrophe risk. Okay. So this is the common figure. Most of the Indonesian island was hit by the earthquakes every year. The exception is only in the Kalimantan, in the middle one. So that's the reason why the new Indonesian capital will be located in this island. So the less prone to the earthquake. Okay. We are also the fourth biggest uh, population in the world, just after America. Meanwhile, the insurance penetration is only 3%. 3% in 2022. One of the main reasons is the low of the financial literacy. About the, the map of Indonesia, it is already 16 years old this year. And this, and this company is owned by all the general insurance and reinsurance company that has license in Indonesia. So this is uh, mandatory by the government. And this is kind of a joint venture initiative of the insurance industry in Indonesia. So our shareholder is all the, the companies. It's about 70 company. So our focus is to develop a national database and conducting a research about the disaster insurance in Indonesia. We produce a insurance premium. So this is just example for the earthquake insurance rate and zones in Indonesia. It is divided into five category. And it will be a practical baseline for all insurance company in Indonesia. So we are the agency for the insurance rating. Regarding to the, our research, most of our research is on Java Island. The reason behind it is uh, the insurance exposure is concentrated in this island. It's this near 70%. So all the catastrophe risks in this island can be a major impact to the insurance industry. So we do some flood modeling in several cities. We model the S dispersion for the 35 volcanic eruption all across uh, the island, the tsunami from the southern part of the Java. And also one of our focus for the time being is the uh, earthquake source zone just next to the Jakarta. Okay. It is called a Baribis Fall. This fall can produce an earthquake up to 7.2 7 magnitude scale or the intensity around 8 MMI, if you are familiar. This, this is uh, classified into a severe category. We found that this fall can, this fall is active. Actually, we do some monitoring since 2020, and it can be an extreme threat for the, uh, for the industry. Regarding to the climate risk, we do flood modeling in several big cities in Indonesia, just like uh, Jakarta, Surabaya, and uh, last month we do some rapid flood modeling in Makassar. In the, this is in the Sulawesi Island. And, all, and also to all these uh, coastal cities that can be impacted by the sea level rise regarding to the, 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 to the climate change. So that's a, a very short introduction, uh, uh, Quilin. Uh, I'll send back to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Caroline, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today as part of this conversation. Um, as Aqueline said, I'm the Associate Vice President for Economics and Policy at EDF. And for the last, oh, I don't know, 15 plus years, my work has focused on disaster insurance markets. Uh, so I'm a researcher, um, and that's included a number of topics. And I'll mention just a few of them to give you a sense of some of the work that I do. 
Um, so the first has been looking at the role that disaster insurance plays in household and community recovery. So for example, a colleague at Freddie Mac and I have a new working paper out just last week actually, that draws on survey data from um, households that were impacted by one of four major um, US landfalling hurricanes. And we look at their financial trajectory recovering from these events. And the first thing to say, which of course, I'm sure most people listening to this conversation know is that disasters impose very wide ranging costs on households that of course include the property destruction to home and contents and vehicles, but also can include a range of non property costs, whether that's evacuation expenses or temporary living or having to buy generators and fuel while the grid is down or um, higher commuting costs. We also found that 40 to 50% of folks at the same time they face these huge expenses also saw a loss of income. So these are really negative financial shocks. And to recover from them, people have to draw on a whole bunch of different sources of funding for recovery. But we found that the households that had insurance for these had fewer financial burdens in both the short and the long run and were less likely to report unmet financial needs. So insurance really does provide this important financial safety net for households. And we also found that insurance can provide spillover benefits to the local economy because we found after a flood, as the share of households that had flood insurance increased, that increased visitation to local businesses. So the idea is that it puts more money into the community for um, recovery, which can then, of course, spur and jumpstart the local economy more. But given all these benefits, <laughs> lots of people don't have insurance, which is another aspect of things we've been looking at. And of course, that's true globally with a large protection gap or the share of uninsured losses. And also true in places like the US where I work, where we otherwise have pretty well developed insurance markets. And we found that there's really no silver bullet for that because there's lots of reasons. People might not understand the risks that they're exposed to really good. Here in the US, we don't do that great a job communicating about these risks. They might not understand insurance. It's a product that's kind of different from most other things people buy and might not have the financial tools to understand how it fits in their overall financial picture. But a really big one is affordability, right? Many households just can't afford it. And in some early work with a colleague, we looked at how the catastrophic and correlated nature of disasters, everybody getting hit by the same time, makes them just much more expensive to provide insurance for, and sometimes even beyond what the private sector can do. And so they can't sometimes be offered, that type of coverage can't be offered at a price that people are either willing or able to pay for. And that can cause breakdowns in the market. And then, as you can see there, then lots of government interventions and in how to make disaster insurance available or more affordable. So another line of work that I'm interested in is how do you design those public sector programs? They exist all over the world in different countries. They take a wide variety of forms. How do we make sure they're set up to provide comprehensive coverage, equitable access, and also good incentives for risk reduction? Um, we find that while some are doing a great job, often disaster insurance isn't working well enough for people right now. And I think we'll probably come back to that in the conversation about how to make it do a better job at supporting recovery. But the last thing I want to mention before we get into some of those conversations is just that um, the other piece of my work recently has been focused on innovation in the insurance sector in a way that can promote broader social and environmental goals. So I released a book this past fall called Understanding Disaster Insurance, New Tools for a More Resilient Future. And the last third of that was focused on how different types of products or partnerships or policies could help us um, better link insurance with climate adaptation, with more greater equity and recovery, and even how to support biodiversity um, protection. So um, I'll stop there. That's kind of an overview of the types of topics and work that I do. Thank you, Carolyn. That actually leads us into the first question. So I think you touched base on quite a bit of what I'm about to ask. So perhaps Henke can start with, can you first tell us a little bit about your work around disaster insurance specifically? And we'll love to hear more about the research you've done and the research that you're currently doing at MyPAC and how does that um, work within Indonesia and can any of the lessons from Indonesia be carried over to other um, countries. Okay, thank you, Eileen. The main uh, insurance product in Indonesia is regarding to the earthquake and the following perils just like tsunami and volcanic eruption. So that's the main point of the catastrophic insurance in Indonesia. Okay, uh, 
regarding our research, we we my park has a my park research network. So this is a collaboration with the best university in the country. So every time we do some specific research uh, regarding to the specific uh, race on that uh, area, we always conduct a co cooperation with the local universities. So this is just like a national building capacity for Indonesia regarding to the insurance, uh, catastrophe insurance. Okay. Uh, Based on our experience, I I can say there are two key lessons from my perspective, uh, Equilin. The first one is in the ecosystem that government financial resource always limited, the collaboration with private sector is a must. Okay. The private sector is always less bureaucratic, more agile, and also lean on a prudent risk management procedure. So this uh, the the key element that will be a major uh, a major factor for the sustainable catastrophe risk uh, in in Indonesia. Okay. The second one it is uh, quite local. Practically, Indonesian government gives a compensation or incentive to the victim of the disaster uh, every natural disaster uh, occur. Uh, to rebuild their damaged houses. The amount is around 50 million rupiah per house or around 3,000 USD. So in my uh, perspective, if this amount switch into the insurance protection, there will be much more people's houses that can be protected. And this is also swiftly can be used to rebuild the houses just after disaster events. So that's the two main, uh, I cannot say that's a lesson, two main things that based on our perspective the, in Indonesia. The first one is the lack of the financial resource. The second one, do something more efficiently. That's a Colin, thank you. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, please go ahead and ask her the same question and just maybe expound on the research that you started introducing in your, um, when you introduced yourself around the blogs and the books that you've written. Um, in particular, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about the US market being overvalued by $200 billion um, due to un, unpriced climate um, change. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about that study um, that was led by a colleague of mine at Environmental Defense Fund. And what we did in that research was look at re the residential housing market in the US and current home prices, sort of values of these properties, but compare it to what um, flood models coupled to climate projections would suggest are going to be the future damages impacting some of these properties located in um, flood risk areas. And we found that those home prices today aren't really reflecting this potential future risk. So there's not a lot of understanding in the market right now or a reflection in prices about potential increases in damages that are going to be coming as climate accelerates flood losses in the United States, which is both a function of changing storm patterns, um, more intense precipitation mm -hmm. events, and um, and uh, storm surge, right, and sea level rise. So there's a host of factors driving up flood risk. And it also relates to an earlier point I had, which is for the housing and mortgage markets in the US and elsewhere to work efficiently, there has to be full and transparent information about all these risks. So that means we need to do a really good job of communicating to market participants about the risks today and the trajectories of where those risks are going in the future in order to make informed decisions, which we don't see as much of now as we should. <laughs> Great, thank you. Henke, um, just let me um, ask you a quick question regarding Indonesia, um, the government ensuring um, assets since 2016 and a lot of those assets are obviously um, buildings and companies are required to ensure their buildings. Um, can you explain if that includes multi-family housing and if not are there any plans for the government to start being more inclusive with multi-family housing 
as well as as you said as you stated if they're giving funds to individual households at three thousand dollars after the disaster how can they actually try to incorporate that into the current scheme that they have okay well, i will try to to, to, to define the context of the catastrophe uh, protection first, uh, equally. The first one is uh, for the commercial and industrial asset. Okay, we do not need we do not need to pay attention to this particular subject because it is already in the good risk management procedure for the, each company. Okay. The second one is to answer your question about the government asset. Indonesian government since 2016 already started to insure all their assets for the catastrophe risk, all the nationwide, okay? Uh, it can, the plan is to be full protected in 2022, but delayed to the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, issue. So the plan is pushed uh, back to 2025. So all the Indonesian assets will be fully protected in 2025. So that's uh, it, 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 the, the changing, okay. The last one is for the housing sector, okay. I can see, say to you, to, to the audience, that in Indonesia, it is only about 0.2% housing that has a disaster insurance, 0.2%, okay. And of course, most of them is uh, the middle to high income community. The gap is that quite big in this sector, actually. So uh, the question is how to protect more people, how to protect the most vulnerable, vulnerable population. Okay. For the time being, at least there are two initiatives that progressing in Indonesia. The first one is we are in the series of intense discussion between the private sector and Indonesian government about how to develop the best disaster risk financing and insurance scheme for Indonesia. So the example, the funded in Mexico, CCRIF in Caribbean or CCIP in Turkey, we want to develop the same scenario, okay. And this is, can be a game changer. I can say the, the budget allocating and management, the, reg, the, the regulation is there and most of them is, uh, to protect the housing sector for the Indonesian people countrywide. The second one is about the utilization of micro insurance and parametric insurance scheme. Okay. Different with the traditional insurance scheme or called indemnity, the parametric scheme can be set into a very affordable premium for specific advantages. Okay. For instance, Indonesian Public Works Ministry has a program to protect around 180,000 houses of a very low income people in Indonesia using parametric scheme. The insurance premium is only around $3 a year, $3 a year for protection up to 50 million rupiah. So this is one of the quite quite good uh, for the Indonesia, for the low income people. And regardless, parallel with this initiative, the ultimate approach is always to educate the people about their risk and about the financial instrument that can be used to protect their assets. That's all the landscape for Indonesian perspective, I call it. Thank you. I think both you and Carolyn have now touched on the fact that um, awareness and financial literacy regarding insurance is something that is obviously lacking and could po possibly need to be bolstered um, in the US as well as in Indonesia. Do you think there would be more uptake if, um, if people were more aware of products available as well as affordability of the products that are available? You can answer Caroline and then Henke can do Sure, I agree we need better awareness, both first of the risks that people face. And here in the US, for example, we have some disclosure requirements that people are told, 
you're in this particular type of flood zone, but we don't do a really good job comprehensively across risks and also making that tangible for people. So what does it mean to be in a floodplain? What are the financial consequences of that? How likely are these floods? How much damage are they going to do to me? And what types of resources can I expect in order to recover from those? We don't have those types of conversations, which is a really important part <clears throat> of households being able to make good uh, risk management decisions. So the first thing is understanding the risks and what they financially mean. And then the second thing is understanding insurance and where that fits in the tools for kind of helping protect your household against these events. And that requires um, some base levels of financial literacy. And then beyond just understanding the kind of basics of insurance that you're paying this small amount every year to be financially protected when something really big and bad <laughs> happens to you, in the US, at least, the policies can get really complicated, and it's a bit of a burden on consumers to figure out exactly what's covered in their policies and what's not, and what types of coverages they need. So, for example, most folks here have a standard property insurance policy, but it doesn't include flooding, it doesn't include earthquakes. And for some types of disasters like hurricanes, you might have a much higher deductible. And for some types of damages like burst pipes or mold, there might be hidden limits on how much coverage you actually get. So people often don't even understand whether they're fully covered. Um, and I think it's often a bit too much to ask consumers to be able to get into that fine print. So we either need to do a better job with agents or others helping really guide people through that decision making, or we need to um, sort of mandate some baseline coverages so that we know that everyone's protected without having to make all these little tiny decisions. And that gets to the kind of last part of your question, which is, if we did a better job with all this education and information, how much would it change, you know, the extent of people who are protected? And I think, you know, only a little, unfortunately, because I think one of the biggest barriers right now still comes back to what we've been talking about, which is the affordability and just being able to have the funds to pay for the protection you need. And a lot of people just don't. And unfortunately, the people who don't are the people who need that protection the most. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a number of interesting possible solutions in that space. Hinky's mentioned some of them, which are interesting sort of partnerships with the public sector, new emerging things like micro insurance, which is actually something that the US is now starting to think about too. Puerto Rico is the only place here that's enabled a micro insurance market, but it's it's a lesson we've taken from other countries to kind of help um, vulnerable populations here as well. So um, I think we have the start at some solutions, but we're not, not quite there yet. <laughs> Thank you. Any thoughts on that particular? Sorry, I just got an interrupted uh, connection. Can you repeat your question, please? Uh, okay, we were just um, finishing off on your conversation regarding affordability of insurance, and that is only $3 per year for insurance yeah. um, to actually mm -hmm. happen. So I was asking in terms of financial literacy, um, mm -hmm. would more awareness allow people to uptake the insurance um and so carolyn was discussing how that might be working in the us and i was trying to see if you could discuss it for indonesia maybe and also apply a global context to it okay if if we rely on from the bottom to top approach uh, we 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 try to teach the the community teach the people in my opinion it will be a gun it will be a long and rainy road actually <laughs> so the the effective one is always based based on the top to bottom approach okay there's a political will at the first place and build a re good regulatory for the specific uh, purposes and and it can be done in the entire nation uh, based on my experience in Indonesia, that's the best way to to solve uh, a specific problem. Actually, just finish on the top level decision in the government, and it can be applied to to all the community. Actually, just like the what I said before, three dollars a year. This is the program by the ministry, actually, not by the local local government or something like that by the ministry in the central of uh, government actually. 
Could I maybe expand on that? Because I think it's an important point that um, yes. it's really hard to get disaster insurance take up if you're going person by person, house by house, and trying to convince them about it. And the places mm -hmm. where you see really high levels of take up, I think, are those kind of top down approaches where either the government's mandated that natural catastrophes be included in all policies, and then you tend to see some sort of government backstop for that type of approach, um, or mm -hmm. these types of auto enrollment programs, um, or insurance mandates. But those are the kind of when you have that kind of program, that is, I agree, when you see actual significant changes in the amount of people who are insured. Yeah. Okay, great. And then just let me, um, I guess, maybe move towards the actual products that um, insurance provides. What are some of the products in the insurance space that are shifting systems towards resilience, if any? And if not, what would you suggest? What products would you suggest? Okay, I want, let me answer uh, the question first, okay? Thank you. The, in the, the traditional ways of the insurance product is always limited. Uh, for the time being, we can use the, the technology, actually, the digital era, to, to make a new channel for the uh, insurance purchasing, actually. So the people just need a very simple, and a very quick uh, insurance scheme. So that's the reason why the parametric and micro insurance is the future for to, to embrace of the people with the good protection, actually. So it can be very uh, based on uh, the characteristic of the region, actually. In Indonesia, uh, it, it, it can be done to the earthquake risk, actually, but not for the climate risk. Maybe just like in uh, another country that there there is no specific agency that can, that produce specific parameters that can be done in the parametric scheme. So what, that's the main the main uh, situation actually. We we cannot rely on uh, the the insurance company or the government to produce the parameter. We need a third party that independently. It can be done in earthquake, but just like USGS in, in, in America, we also have BMKG in Indonesia, but not for the climate risk, actually. So I just uh, can answer the question by utilization of the parametric scheme. That's the best answer. So. OK. Um, and Carolyn, obviously, I, I'm, I'm getting the sense that when we speak about Indonesia and perhaps other countries that are in the similar situation as Indonesia, um, if government intervention is not there, there is really no um, private intervention happening. Whereas in the US, a lot of interventions are obviously private. Um, and then government comes in only when there is extreme um, disaster. Um, can you then maybe just talk about what products we could discuss that are currently existing that can shift towards resilience? Yeah, sure. Happy to. And um, while we have sort of widespread property insurance here, when it comes to the disaster insurance, I think we face a lot of similar challenges that are really global in scope about the difficulty in insuring these types of events. Um, and so we have similar challenges with disaster insurance gaps, and a lot of disaster insurance is provided through public sector programs, whether it's our federal flood program or state pools for hurricane or wildfire or earthquake, which are also increasingly public. So, um, so I do think that there are similarities around the globe in the difficulty and the need for cross-sector partnerships in order to secure coverage for these. Um, on the question of sort of building resilience, I agree that there's some really interesting um, and innovative things emerging around the use of parametric type approaches. Um, and I thought I'd throw out an example. I'm not involved in it in any way. So this is all secondhand knowledge, but it's very intriguing to me as a way to start thinking about better linking insurance with resilience. And that's something called um, the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program. And it's also parametric. And the idea is to turn the idea of insurance on its head so that instead of just paying people 
to have to rebuild and after the fact to compensate them for damages to prevent those damages in the first place, right? Um, so in this particular example, the trigger for the payout is an indication based on satellite data. So to the same point of like new data and technology is really opening up new approaches um, that indicates that drought is um, advancing. And the this program is designed for pastoralists whose um, livelihood depends on their livestock. And a drought is one of the leading causes of death for the livestock, right, when they don't get enough water or food. And so the idea here is that this program mobilizes the funding before the livestock dies to buy food and extra water in order to prevent them from dying in the first place. So instead of compensating for the loss, let's prevent the loss from happening. And I think that's a really neat shift in mindset um, that um, you know, we need to do some more thinking and creative brainstorming on how we could apply that to other contexts and other types of perils. And it might not be strictly insurance because a related thing um, that I've seen growing globally is something called forecast-based financing, which is the idea of using that same concept of a trigger, a parametric trigger, but this time it's not releasing claims payouts that you paid for with a premium, but just releasing disaster aid so that the government aid funds are released when there's a forecast that something bad's going to happen in order to provide the resources for preparedness, for emergency response, so that hopefully then losses are less severe. So I think that's like another type of way we could think about some of these instruments um, that might help, yeah, build more resilience. Okay, I want to add some... Uh, Maybe you know more about them. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I said before that parametric scheme is rely on the characteristic of the area actually. Just like Caroline said about the using uh, satellite images to as a parametric, as other parameters, the Indonesian region is a very active atmosphere actually. So most of the year uh, the area is covered by the cloud actually. So there's an uh, obstacle to, to use uh, satellite images for the specific uh, days, specific time, uh, just to cali calibrate, is it uh, the, the, pay, the insurance payout is active or not? So that's very tricky, actually, just regarding the, to the area, actually. OK, and... Um... How do we use insurance to prevent future disasters? Does it come down to building back better or are there any other ways? Is there such a thing? Okay, please, Caroline. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, uh, and again, I know my, my work is so US focused, so, um, you know, so that's my lens on things, but I think it's really important here to do a better job of linking the insurance to building back stronger or differently. And that's sometimes frustratingly difficult to do. And I think um, here there's kind of two challenges and I'm interested in whether these are similar challenges faced in other countries around the world. The first is the funding. Sometimes building back more resiliently costs more than you know, then not, not always, but sometimes. And so you need your insurance to give you an extra payout for those resilience investments so that, um, yeah, so we need to figure out the, you know, how to pay for that Delta to get that extra money um, to households when they need to make those investments. But more than that, and I think even, I think more important than that, like that's solving a funding problem, which I think we could figure out. Um, the harder thing that we've seen is that post-disaster is, you know, it's a terrible time for people, right? It's chaotic, it's stressful. You're dealing with so much loss and challenge. And it's not a time when people can be learning about resilience or thinking about what they need to do to their homes or searching out people who can advise them on this. So it really needs to be coupled with a sort of high touch program that can work with households and give them exactly what they need each step of the way. Like these are the investments that you need for the perils that you face. Here are the people that can do that for you. And we trust that they're going to do a good job and they're going to charge you a fair price and, and kind of take them through that whole journey because it's not something that they can seek out on their own. And in the rush to rebuild and just get back to normal, we unfortunately see sometimes when communities will just like waive resilient building code requirements, 
um, or people just rush to do you know what they had before. Um, and so creating a window of opportunity there to to do the the investment in resilience, I think is the the crap the nut we need to solve the, the thing we need to solve for, right? So yeah. Okay. And Hanky, do you need to add to that? Okay. The first one, the spirit of the build back better can be done only if the money is there. Okay. The question is, where's the money come from? If we rely on the government budget, that's always limited, especially for Indonesian perspective. So that's the reason why we try to push the 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 role of the private sector into into the into the into the problem. So the money to build back better can be came from the insurance payout. So that's the first the first uh, my first statement. In other hand, uh, to prevent future disaster, uh, the insurance can play a wider role regarding mitigating the risk actually. It can be a tool to forcing the community to, to apply specific building code that disaster resilient. So the first wall. The second one is it can be done to mandatory catastrophe insurance purchasing for the community that located in a very high risk area. So just like in, in the Turkey, if you if you do not buy the earthquake insurance you will not get electricity and the water to your house just after your 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 house was located in the very high earthquake uh, risk so that's uh, another things for the mitigation approach that built in the single house level uh, basically the insurance the insurance company can give you a discount actually just to to I can suggest to have a good uh, things about your 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 initiative. Okay, the last one, Equilin, uh, to prevent future disaster. Based on my perspective as an insurance company, well, people say that we cannot manage what we cannot measure. Okay, so that's all about the accuracy. Uh, the the my part Indonesia is really really rely on the granularity of the database, and also the reliability of your research product. Okay. That's the two key aspect for the insurance company, just to prevent the future uh, disaster in, in Indonesian industry actually, granular data and reliable research product. Um, thank you very much. Um, right now, I don't have any further questions from my side. I wanted to go ahead and take questions from our audience. And I have a couple of questions that are waiting for us. Um, the first question, I was hoping to do it live. I'm not exactly 100% sure. But we have a question from Jane Kapp. And um, Jane is asking, Carolyn, can you address what FEMA offers? Yeah, sure. So in the United States, our Federal Emergency Management Agency is the Federal Disaster Response um, Agency. And whenever there's a very large disaster event, the president can issue a disaster declaration. And in doing that, can choose to authorize one or both of two programs that FEMA runs. One is called individual assistance, which provides financial help to households, and the other is public assistance, which provides assistance to local governments. Over 90% of the time, public assistance is authorized, so local governments usually get funding after sizable disasters to cover you know, debris cleanup and infrastructure repairs and repairs of their buildings and so forth. The individual assistance program is authorized, is authorized less frequently, but after very severe disasters, it is activated. And this is a program that provides cash grants to households for different unmet disaster needs. Um, they, it is capped at a little bit more than 30,000 US dollars, so you can't get any more than that, but the typical award is only a few thousand dollars. And that's because these grants are really designed just to make your home safe and habitable again, not bring it back to pre-disaster conditions, which was done intentionally to sort of have insurance be the primary vehicle for recovery. Unfortunately, lots of households don't know that, don't realize that. A lot of the political messaging is that 
you know, you're going to get more generous aid that's really not forthcoming. And as we've already talked about, we have a big disaster insurance gap. And so households that are facing substantial amounts of damage get this very small amount. Um, and so we see very difficult recovery trajectories for households because the amount from FEMA is so limited. There is also a little bit of money for what they call other needs assistance, which is not for your housing, but if you had um, other types of needs post-disaster. So um, there is some money from FEMA, but it's very small and not enough to really make people close to whole again. Yeah. Oh, maybe I'll say one other, just one other quick point on the disaster uh, aid program in the US. Um, if you see sort of like headlines about like billions of dollars appropriated by Congress for disaster recovery, a lot of that money is actually going into a program run by a different federal agency, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development that makes these grants to communities. Um, and it's really for long term reconstruction. So those grants can be very generous. They can be huge amounts of money, but they're not getting to households right away. Um, work by a colleague found that on average, it takes about three years before those dollars are actually like being spent in the community. Um, so that's another um, sort of government source of money, but it's about you know mitigation and long-term reconstruction. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Henke, we have a question for you from Rob Moss. He asks, thanks for your insightful discussion. Based on your experience, what steps would you recommend Turkey take to improve how earthquake insurance works there? Did I? Shall I repeat? Actually, it's not an easy question to be answered, actually, because I do not know that yet, uh, specifically about the Turkey characteristic, actually. But uh, we heard that the, the earthquake pool of the Turkey TCIP has a very good job, actually. Uh, just uh, last week or weeks uh, ago, I read the news about that they already uh, prepared a big amount of money to be uh, the first uh, pay, uh, insurance pay, payout uh, to the community actually uh, for, for the Turkey. And uh, it is a good news that uh, TCIP can be that strong. Maybe in the USA experience, Caroline, every severe uh, catastrophe or events, there are a lot of uh, insurance company that uh, bankrupt uh, just in, in the past, in, the, in 1916 maybe. Okay. So I, I cannot answer your specific question actually about the Turkey. Okay, thank you. Um... Another question that we have is, or anonymous attendee, can you speak a bit more about flood risk disclosure? Is any state or location doing it well? Any policies that are particularly good for requiring flood and other risk disclosure in the sale of land and properties? I take it this will be for Carolyn. I can say a little bit about how this is done in the US. So in the US, um, our flood insurance program is federal. It's a federal government program and it's 90% of the residential flood market right now. And as part of that program, they produce maps for the country that show the 100 year floodplain, the area where there's a 1% chance of a flood. We call it the special flood hazard area, the SFHA. Um, this is all background to say that the disclosures that take place in the US are around whether your property is in or out of that zone. So lots of states have disclosure laws, which means that when someone's going to buy a property, the seller of that property has to make available um, information on flood risk. And most of the laws in most states make say that the seller has to say whether or not you're in this zone. A few states go further than that and say that if the seller knows of prior flood damage, they have to also disclose that there's been a flood. Um, the challenge is that whether or not you're located in the SFHA is not a super good communication tool, right? Like, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of frequency of flooding, in terms of severity of flooding? Um, so there are these disclosures, but they don't really give people the amount of information that they need to make good decisions. And right now, if you're in that 
area and you have a loan, a mortgage from a federally backed or regulated lender, you're required to purchase flood insurance. So this gets back to our earlier conversation about these types of top-down mandates or when you can see like wider take up. Um, but unfortunately, a challenge with this is that it, you, um, even though it's a federal program and the prices are set nationally and should be very, uh, uh, you know, don't vary from company to company, there's no way for someone to easily look up what the price of flood insurance is. And so that information is not feeding into the market about today's risks. In order to get that price, you have to contact a flood insurance agent and get a quote. And most people don't go through that hassle until they're pretty attached and down the road to a property. So we have several things we need to do to make um, information more available earlier. And we're starting to see that happen outside of the government. So um, other types of groups like the nonprofit, um, the First Street Foundation is starting to make more comprehensive flood information available for every property and integrated into real estate websites. So we're moving in a direction of better information, um, but there's still a little bit of ways to go. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, do you have anything to add to that or can I go to the next question? Well, it can be the next, the next question. Okay, so I probably should have asked this during my recap. Someone is asking, can you please explain what a parametric scheme is again? And also what is an indemnity scheme? Okay. The indemnity scheme is the traditional ways to insure your asset actually. Let's say that you have a house about 1 million USD and you stated that information to the insurance company and they will be charged you for specific premium. Once you, your house get hit by the earthquake, the loss adjuster will come to your house and will be and assess your, your, your damage of your houses and the insurance company will pay as much as the damage happened to your house. So let's say your house is total total breakdown. So they will give you a money about 1 million USD. That's an indemnity basis. Okay. For the parametric scheme, they want to cut the process to uh, assess the houses because they need the, the money very quickly just after the earthquake. So they just rely on the specific parameters. Let's say the MMI, the scale is one until 12, okay. Let's say that your house is heated by seven MMI, then in your parametric scheme, you will get the, the payout, for, exa for example, of 70% of uh, the specific number. Okay. So that's the parametric. Just after the parameters is, uh, uh, I can say, completed, your pay, your payment will will be very quickly uh, sent to you. So that's the the idea about the the parametric. Carolyn, if you want to add some information, please. No, that was perfect. That was exactly right. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. our standard insurance policies here mm -hmm. and elsewhere tend to be indemnity, like just. Like Hanky was saying, like the loss adjuster has to come and you only get your loss. Um, I think, you know, just to stress exactly what he said, the two biggest benefits of parametric are speed. You get the money way faster than having to wait for a loss adjuster when there might not be enough of them after a big disaster. And they take a long time. You have to negotiate with your company. So you get money in days instead of weeks or months. And it's really flexible dollars. You can use it for whatever your highest need is. Um, and so it's not a replacement, in, at least in the U.S. context, for something like a homeowner's policy. But it is another really important tool when speed and flexibility are important. And we know, and I don't know if this is true in Indonesia and other places, but here we have a really big challenge with getting people the resources they need like immediately. And we're seeing in some of our survey research that lots of funding, whether it's from the government or even your insurance, can take a long time to get to people. And higher income households are fine. They have savings, they use their credit card, like whatever they can wait. But really low income households really struggle because if they don't have the money they need to make their home safe, to find somewhere else to live, to begin processes like mold remediation that are important for their health and other things like this, um, then they have to do things like fall behind on their bills or their mortgage or defer spending on other important things like medical care. And it can just be really costly for 
for the household. And so these are places where we're looking at parametric type approaches to help meet those immediate needs and provide that, um, yeah, that, that assistance right away. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> and just continuing on from that, someone is wondering what role do you see catastrophic bonds playing in supplementing coverage, particularly in areas um, where government, governmental and regional budgets are limited? I can say something first and then you can jump in if you want. Um, okay, thank okay. you. Bonds are so a lot of parametric approaches are actually not technically insurance. Some are, but some are actually insurance-like financial products. And catastrophe bonds are one of these. They're actually a financial instrument. Um, and in one of these things, the entity seeking financial coverage gets what's sort of like an insurance product with this third party entity who issues a bond to investors. And so investors are putting in money that's held. And if the, the trigger occurs, the money goes like a parametric insurance product and the investors lose their capital. If the event doesn't happen over the time frame of the bond, then the investors get all the premium payments plus whatever the kind of um, safe returns were, the returns from investing the somewhere safe were. So that's kind of the structure. Um, catastrophe bonds have their, um, they're a little bit of a scale thing. Like you can't use them for very small households. Can't use them. They're used by like big companies or countries or large public sector entities in the U S for example, the New York city, um, transit authority has used catastrophe bonds since 2012 for, um, getting funds quickly should a disaster impact like the New York city subway system, for example. And we also see them used, um, like Mexico has made use of them. I know, um, at the level of, you know, the country. So, um, yeah. I don't know if you have anything else to add. <laughs> um, no, I don't have anything else to add. I suppose that answers the question regarding the budgets and how they are limited. Um, obviously, if it's, um, if it's government and or the companies, their budgets are probably not as limited as households. And since this does not apply to households, I think that answered that question. Um, and then I think the Can last I question add that some, we have... some answer about catastrophe okay. bond, Ecoline? Of course, of course, go ahead. Okay. Uh, it, it, will, it will be a short answer, actually. Okay. In my opinion, catastrophe bond is just a, like a gambling issue. You need to know very accurately about your risk, then you buy a bond for the, uh, for the catastrophic bond. Unless in that quest, uh, in that uh, situation, please do not uh, use the catastrophic bond. The cat, cat bond, it can be much, uh, uh, I can say, uh, it, it, it will be cost you a little bit lower regarding the traditional risk transfer to the reinsurance company. So that's one of the good opportunity if you have a very good information about your own risk. So because uh, the capital is there, but uh, they do not provide an adequate um, modeling or something like that, uh, just like a reinsurance company like Munichri or Swissri. So this is just a, like a gambling. <laughs> If you hit, you can get a good uh, payout, but if you do not have that uh, lucky, you will get a loss of money, big money, sorry. Thank you, uh, Colleen. Thank you. Um, our last question for today is from Aris. Um, the question is, please discuss Indonesia's plan to make its capital, to move its capital, apologies. Um, what is the plan, time frame, cost, impact on people living in Jakarta? Okay. This is a very sensitive uh, question, Aris. I, I cannot answer all, all your questions, actually. But uh, the, gov uh, the planning of our government is since uh, last year or two years ago to move uh, Jakarta uh, to the Kalimantan Island. The idea is because not only that Kalimantan is less prone regarding the, to the catastrophe, but it is also just because the Java Island is overpopulated actually. So it needs a very big money. Our government is uh, quite difficult to find a good investor actually. Some investors show their interest and then 
uh, get out so interest and get out so the people still try to find the best uh, investor actually they give and they give uh, uh, so many advantages if you want to uh, if you interest to that particular uh, project but the there are no uh, many investor that are interested in, in the project actually okay uh, <laughs> the, the idea is maybe in the next five or ten years our capital city will move to the Kalimantan the idea is uh, not for the time being government actually but since our first president Sukarno they already has a plan to move uh, the capital to the to the Kalimantan and the impact to the people in Jakarta it the impact is uh, very big in the government official actually they are quite i can say that they are not not in a good mood to move to the Kalimantan they just want to stay in Java actually because the infrastructure is there that's Aris uh, Papa Dupulus. Thank you for your question. Thank you, um, Kenki. Um, I think this will close out our program. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Carolyn and Henki. We really appreciate that you took the time. And for those that attended, thank you very much. Um, we'll look forward to the next webinar. Sure. <laughs> thank you.